Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 22nd, 2018 meeting of the Northampton <coughs> School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair, and we'll begin the meeting with the roll call. Ms. Molly Burnham? Present. Present. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. 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 Here. Present. 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 Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is our public comment period. And uh, we ask that folks uh, please state their name and address for the record. Um, and I'll be keeping a three minute uh, timer. Um, and the only person we have signed up is Jeremy Whalen. Have to follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeremy Whalen, uh, 213 Russell Street, Hadley, Massachusetts, also a technology teacher at the high school. Uh, I figured I've bugged you individually, um, but I haven't seen you all in some months. So uh, I had a couple of thank yous uh, to, um, to say thank you to you. Um, to the PTO, uh, the PTO has been great. I've been meeting with the PTO to, f um, to find out ways to uh, make both receiving and um, getting funds uh, more efficient. Uh, but in addition, uh, additionally to that, they, we actually received, uh, the tech department received uh, two um, different gifts. Uh, and the first one was actually for Model UN, which I'm the advisor to, uh, which allowed us to go to uh, the Yale conference in which uh, we won uh, several outstanding delegate awards. Uh, as well as pay for uh, UMass and the registration for that as well, in which we also won a couple of outstanding delegate awards. Um, another gift from the, the PTO was uh, f that went towards our virtual reality project that my social entrepreneurship uh, class did. For those of you unfamiliar with that, uh, my stu the students partnered with Safe Passage and NCTV to uh, create a 3D uh, film around early warning signs of domestic abuse, and I think that they did a terrific job. Uh, and they're actually going to be partnering with the White Ribbon Campaign and Jane Doe Inc. on April 4th for a uh, a, um, a panel discussion on the awareness of uh, violence against women. So I think they did a terrific job at that. I think it was some meaningful outreach in our uh, community, um, and I thank the PTO for allowing us to uh, receive funds for some of that gear uh, in order to uh, you know make that happen. Uh, additionally, NCTV, we, um, we have been benefiting from licenses, a shared license um, uh, agreement with for Adobe products, and those Adobe products are invaluable to the education of uh, my students. Uh, we routinely use Photoshop in Premiere Pro for our photography and uh, video editing, uh, and the, um, the licenses have allowed us to make a uh, weekly news broadcast called The Transcript, as well as some award-winning documentaries. One was actually, we just uh, received honorable mention in the C-SPAN student cam documentary uh, contest, one of which the producer is in our midst. So um, really proud of what the students accomplish, and uh, I thank the PTO, NCTV, and uh, all the sponsors of our department, um, and I'll keep on coming as long as you know people keep on supporting us. Um, and the final thing, I would just like to uh, say thank you to how our district, both administrative, administrative, administrators and students, uh, handled uh, the uh, protests and the marches. I think that uh, it really shows um, the integrity of our district when we can uh, work with our student bodies and the integrity of our students to approach it in such a respectful and mature manner. So, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment period who did not sign up? Okay. So, we will now move into announcements. Are there any um, announcements from the school committee? Members of the school committee? Yes. Hi. Um, the Student Union is co-sponsoring the Northampton March for Our Lives, which is this Saturday, March 24th, at noon, beginning at Northampton High and concluding with a rally at City Hall. Many Northampton High groups are co-sponsoring this event, including the Student Union, GSA, Feminist Collective, um, Young Democrats, Teen Advocacy Group, Mayor's Youth Commission. Um, so this is something many Northampton High students have been working really hard on. Um, and again, it begins at noon at Northampton High. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other announcements from school committee members? Okay, so um, the, uh, one of the primary um, 
issues on our agenda tonight under reports and recommendations is um, a continuation of our discussion and possible vote on the FY 2019 budget. Um, I wonder, Dr. Provost, if you wanted to maybe just talk a little bit about feedback we've re you've received, and I know you've been sharing some of it with us um, as it's come in, but yes. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yes, uh, I would like to start by just summarizing that. I want members of the public to know that their feedback has been shared with the full committee. This is what the packet looks like, and we, there's feedback that's coming through a variety of means. Um, including Twitter again this year. Uh, most of it has come in via email. Um, we haven't had any oral feedback except um, joint school committee meet, or joint school council meeting, which I'll be talking about a little bit later in this. So just summarizing what's in the <coughs> packet before the school committee, there were um, two comments requesting <coughs> a clarification of Bridge Street changes. And so I just want to offer some feedback on that. Um, so. In the proposed budget, we are proposing to increase a half-time special educator to full-time and to use a teacher who is duly certified and currently working in a special education this year as a classroom teacher next year. The net of these two connected changes is an additional full-time general ed teacher and reduction in, of a half-time special ed teacher. So that was a little um, confusion around that. I just wanted to clarify that. Also, wanting to walk through the $203,000 increase at Bridge Street School. $100,000 of that is um, accounted for moving costs from the Special Education Cost Center into the Building-Based Cost Center um, because resources that were currently reported to Special Ed are now um, going to be general ed in the next year's budget. Another $31,000 was the increased ESL services for Bridge Street School and $46,000 are raises for current staff. That's the majority of that $203,000. Um, there were two comments requesting more detail about teacher assignments for Bridge Street for next year. Um, those, of course, are impossible to tell at this time because the budget is still proposed. Um, but my expectation is that when the budget is passed, Ms. Choquette will be able to communicate with her parents about that. Um, I know that there are different scenarios that have been drawn up for different possible budget contingencies, um, but in, I, I think that wisely, instead of putting those out with names attached to them, um, the administration of the building is holding off to see what happens with the budget. Um, there was one comment just of general support for the budget proposal. There was one comment of support for increasing the band position at the high school. And then, as I mentioned, there was a joint <coughs> school council meeting this year. It was the first time we had tried that. Actually, the first time um, I'd ever seen that done. That was a really good event. Um, and the, the people there said that they would like to see that become a part of the process of getting public feedback. Um, I think it's a way of elevating the roles of the school councils, which are supposed to be advising the principals on their use of the budget. So I think it's a very concrete way of doing that. So from that meeting, we um, received commentary in support of the additional ESPs and ELL services that are included in the current budget. Um, there was excitement about the technology changes. I will say Mr. Whalen was in that group, so he may have um, sort of been stimulating some of the excitement around that. Um, there were concerns about adding Chinese, and then there were concerns about the overall tightness of the budget and um, discussion of what ed public education finance looks like at the local, state, and federal <coughs> level. And then the other thing that I would add is there were a number of questions from school committee. The m most um, of the questions that we received this time were not from the public, but were from school committee members. I honestly lost track of the number of questions that we received from the school committee. I can say this, um, the committee fully understands the budget that it's about to discuss. And I would share this, I hope it's okay, Candy, that um, Candy shared that in her years of doing this, she's never seen a committee read and understand a budget at the level of detail that this budget has been um, explored. So with that, I, I would just conclude my comments about the feedback. Okay. Is there um, other discussion or uh, other comments or questions? 
was going to say that's what Candy gets for providing a clear budget. <laughs> <laughs> you read it all. That's right. Fine. So any other thoughts or comments on the budget? I have one, but I wasn't sure if I was supposed to wait till it was, the motion was made. It was um, the budget was put on the table. Um, well, if someone wants to do that, we can. If someone wants to make a motion to put the, the budget proposal on the table. I'll make a motion to uh, to approve the uh, FY 2019 budget. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to approve the budget as proposed. Okay. And so now I do have a comment, and um, thank you everybody for all the work and answering many of our questions. I know we've all kept the superintendent's office very busy. Um, so I, before I put an amendment on the table, I just want to explain a thought process that, some, that I went through and ask for um, some more discussion of it. So after the last school committee meeting, I was really struck by Dr. Provost's answer to somebody's question, where would he want more support in this budget? And he responded he felt like the elementary school principals needed more support, and I've seen that in my short time on this committee, how hard these schools are working to support all the kids. And so I called them, and we had a really good heart-to-heart -heart conversation about where that extra support might come from, and we brainstormed a lot. And um, I don't think I need to go through all the details, but my understanding of what happened after that was further discussion with many of um, the teachers and principals and the alt team, and I don't even know everybody that was involved, but a proposal has come out of that that I'm really um, supportive of, mainly because it came from the principals and the superintendent and student services, and I think I'd like to just ask Pam to explain it because she can do a much better job of it than I can. And once she explains it, I'd like to put an amendment out or have some discussion in that. <coughs> so Pam Plummer, Director of Student Services. Um, so one of the things that we started talking about as a group, certainly around, among the principals, John shared with you that when the idea of increasing administrative support at the elementary level came up, it was one of the first things that the principal said, no with all the other pieces that we want, D you know, direct services for students, things that can directly influence students more quickly. It was one of the first things that they put aside. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, shows the, that their hearts and their work, it, it's in the right place. Um, but it is true, like they work tremendous hours, they work really, really hard, and um, I know just from personally for the last five years, regularly consulting with them, that's my primary role, um, just how hard it is. And um, each school, while we've worked really hard to create a strong system, and there are lots of consistencies between the schools, has its own culture, has its own climate, has its own faculty largely. Um, and the idea of having somebody a position that could be split between the schools. Um, it's hard to imagine that someone who would be that split would be able to sort of quickly come in and be able to influence, support, and change um, that quickly. So we started thinking as a group, is there anything else in your building that you have right now that you feel like if that could be boosted, that that would be a support to you, to the students, to the faculty? And one of the things that I had been having separate conversations um, with some of our employees about is the fact that at the elementary level all of our, all of our school psychologists are part-time right now. I am myself a school psychologist so it's a position that is near to and dear to me. Um, but our school psychologists right now aren't full-time in any building. Right now they're in the budget. They're budgeted for 0.8 which is four days a week. Um, at the elementary level our school psychologists have been really instrumental in the student support team process. I don't know if you have, like, there's an antiquated model of school psychology where kids are referred for testing, you test kids, you churn out a report, that's it. School psychologists we have are phenomenal. They're much more interested in systems level work. Um, they've been pivotal in the response to intervention work that we do and the social emotional screenings that we do. Um, they're much more interested in consulting with teams, looking at class-wide interventions, really looking at the whole building at a whole. They tend to be people at the building level that have a real strong analysis uh, or ability to analyze data and understand data. Um, and so we thought, well, what if we increased all of the school psychologists to full-time? They would be the equivalent of adding a .8 position across the district. 
That would also allow us to post a full-time position in two of our buildings right now. That um, Right now we have an intern that is split between Bridge Street and Ryan Road, and she's phenomenal. She's supervised by one of our current school psychologists. Um, there is definitely, um, a, uh, there is a, I, I don't know if there's a shortage officially, but I know just from going to special ed director meetings that everybody's scrambling to find school psychologists. We haven't been able to fill a part-time position at Bridge Street for a couple of years, um, and we weren't able to fill the part-time position that opened up at Ryan Road this last year. Um, and so I think it would, it would be really beneficial for us to be able to post a full-time position or, or, or two full-time positions. Um, I think we'd have a much higher likelihood of having some really strong candidates apply. Um, I think that that would allow, I, you know, I firmly support this idea. I think it really would allow students to benefit directly, teachers to benefit directly, and the principals. Um, as a school psychologist, I, I was always one of the key players in working with principals, and I know that that's true for our school psychologists also. Um, and supporting making hard decisions and um, brainstorming around some of the hardest uh, challenges in the building, around the social emotional needs. I've had some conversations with folks. On the surface of it, it seems like you've got a school of 200 and some kids, you have a full-time psychologist. That is not the old way of doing things. It's really usually based on caseloads and how many evaluations you do. And I think it would be a bold move if we were to say, Forget the old way, like we know if we want to focus on the social emotional behavioral needs of our students, our youngest students, our most vulnerable students, that we have, the, we're committed to recognizing that having a mental health team that is made up of full-time professionals that are there every day to do this work would be a really strong move on our part. So I fully support it. I know that um, the administrators on ALT fully support it and the psychologists fully support it. Do you, uh, did, do you want to speak more to this now? I, I can certainly make an amendment, or if other people have, I'll, I'll make the amendment, and then if people have um, comments, they can make them. Is that? Should we at least establish what we would be losing, what, what this trade off is before we make the amendment, or is that? I can, I can share my understanding, or Dr. So Provost can. So the amendment would so, be to, okay. So, so the motion would be to amend the proposed budget to increase each of the four elementary school psychologists from 0.8 to full time. And um, this would be at a cost of $52,000. And so we would, um, th right now the amendment would be to eliminate four items that the ALT team has proposed as what they would recommend to come up with the $52,000. And those four items are the 0.4 Chinese teacher at $20,000, 0.2 ESL teachers at Bridge Street School, 13,500, reduce global STEM by 10,000, and reduce SPED tuition by 8,000. So there's been a, a, a motion to amend the uh, budget that's on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, so the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, did you want to, would you be helpful to describe those, the administration's view on those budgetary changes? Sure. Okay. Um, the, as Pam said, we met, it was actually the day of the snow day, okay. we met on a gigantic Zoom meeting, um, thanks to some of the increases we made in technology. We called it actually the Brady Bunch meeting because on Zoom, <laughs> everyone gets their own little box and there were like, 15 people on this discussion at once. Um, so, uh, and it was a three hour long discussion. We went through, I think, a whole range of options for how we could provide more support for the elementary principals. We got to the psychologists, I would say about an hour into that, and then spent the other two hours trying to figure out what were the cuts we could make that would have the least impact to the budget. And so that's the cut list that, that we came up with. So I would say that I would agree with Dr. Plummer that this is something that the administration could support and does support. Can I say one thing? Sure. sure. Uh, the ESL piece at Bridge Street School, that's something that had been actually fed back to us from the ESL teacher in the building <coughs> saying that she actually felt that her caseload was, especially with the addition of an ESL um, ESP in the building that she absolutely felt like by going from 0.6 to 0.8 that her caseload would be totally doable. So I don't want it to look like we just decided that that would be a good place to cut. It was actually a recommendation from the teacher. 
Yes. Just, um, can we? Can I ask Dr. Plummer a couple of questions? Sure. Okay. So, um, as much as I appreciate the the notion of helping um, the elementary school principals, um, I see equally as great value in this idea. Potentially, you and I had a conversation, so I just I didn't want I, I wanted to make sure you were um, speaking a little bit about how this. Um, supports the WINS model, yeah. both now and in the future, um, which in and of itself, I know that um, principals are taken away. There's, there's mm -hmm. kids, they need, they're called into class. That will help them in that extent, clearly, I think. But also just the whole, we started this initiative, right. we have some immediate sort of concerns, and we have some long-term sort of being proactive to establish um, you know, a, a culture and a, a high-capacity teaching force that knows mm -hmm. how to include kids and is top quality. So I was impressed with what you shared with me. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, I think the school psychologists are some of the people in the building who have the most amount of training on understanding students with disabilities and helping to figure out how to support them. Um, the fact that they already have relationships in their buildings, the ones that we have, is a real um, strong starting point. The piece that makes it hard to be full part-time is that you're not able to be like a full, full-time available member of that of a consultative model, right? A model that has a really <coughs> set schedule for data analysis, a really set schedule for student support teams. So our school psychologists really, in the, in the buildings that are fully staffed, are really pivotal in setting up student support teams prior to the special ed process, working with teachers to determine if they need to do short-term interventions individually in class or a group, of interve a, a group intervention in their class. Um, and I think they have, you know, they see the kids that go throughout the entire building. They just have the ability to understand the culture of the building in a way um, that is very helpful because it's our adjustment counselors and our, um, our specials teachers also see the kids all the way through. Um, but the fact that the psychologists have this mental health training, I think, is, is really key. Um, and I, I know the psychologists are excited about the idea of having more systems in place for consultation and regular feedback and the ability to just um, reflect and plan and um, to be able to be part of that on a, a full-time basis would be something that we just don't have right now. They are, they are doing really well with the time they're there, mm -hmm. but to have that additional time would be pretty invaluable, I think. Yeah. Dr. Provost. I just wanted to add one comment from the Joint School Council meeting. Um, the way we had designed it was we asked each of the school councils to split up and address one of the topics of the budget goals that they felt <coughs> drawn to. Mm -hmm. And the table that had was overwhelmed with people was the one that talked about increasing our capacity to support students with social emotional um, yeah. concerns. Yeah. And so, you know, this is something that I think not only our teachers and administrators, but the whole community sees as the future need, uh, the current and future need for our um, district. And so when you think about the different range of uh, professional staff that you can hire at the elementary school, school psychologists are the ones that I think come with the deepest um, background knowledge in supporting kids who have a, a variety of emotional needs. Yeah. And a variety of learning needs, which I think makes them really helpful in con consulting with teachers around the inclusion model, because it's everything from learning how to read to learning how to self-regulate. It runs the gamut. Yeah. Yes, Molly. Um, I, d I really want to appreciate sort of the drilling down. I know Laura actually was the person who asked at that meeting, what would you add? And I really appreciated your honest answer and then the work of and the process of sort of going deeper into the um, looking at the budget and thinking about this. And as a former teacher who taught long enough ago that school psychologists were not this model, that was exactly what I wrote to. <laughs> when I heard this, I was like, wow, this model is really changing. Like, tell me about this. And it was, it's so exciting to imagine that this level of expertise is being used in this really different way. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> as much as I think that um, Teaching Chinese is something that I hope that we can, I mean, if this moved ahead, but um, when we consider um, charter schools and where money is um, taken out, um, we know that there's a, a, I think that taking care of our elementary schools as best as we can in these early years is just, we're seeing that that's a big place that we really need to kind of show the community that, that we are 
engaged on that level. <laughs> so I, I, I just really appreciate the whole process. Thank you. Other um, comments speaking to the amendment? Yes, Ms. Busansky. I, well, I really, I really like this amendment. I really like the way that it meets the needs of both helping the administrators at the same time that it's really school-based and helping students. And so I think it's really great that you, everyone involved, came up with this. And I really appreciate it. I'm just curious. I assume Global STEM, that 10,000 was put on the table because it will be okay without it. I just was kind of wondering if you could just speak to that for a moment, just <coughs> to verify. We're, we're there are two things happening with the global STEM that made us feel like we can possibly make that cut without having a, a too drastic of an impact on the district. One is that we were already looking at moving from a middle and elementary deployment to a middle and high school. And the reason for that is that to provide equity at the elementary level, you really have to have programs up and running in four schools, which is hard. Um, if you do the the programs at middle and high, then you can still give all the students in the district an opportunity to participate, um, and you only have to stand up two programs. So um, making that shift will, um, in part, reduce the, the cost of the program. The other thing is that we're, we're on our third year of, of doing the, the, the program. Most of the cost is actually involved with consultative services to help us understand how to run a global STEM program um, and to provide partnerships with, with international schools. We have um, an idea of what we're doing now, so I don't think we need as much um, con consultation. And we do have some partnerships. And we also have some people we've discovered who have some connections to schools overseas that we may be able to capitalize on to sort of replicate the model. So. Um, those are the reasons why we felt that we could make a cut there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Meyer. So I have the same question about the sped reduced sped tuition. I'm just wondering is that a, is that just because it's was there and we felt like it would I mean because eight thousand dollars doesn't sound like any increment of sped right. tuition that I've no. received. So I'm just wondering <laughs> how we get it. I can't tell you. I mean the. The tuition projections for next year change daily, right. um, and so at this point, I feel very comfortable that we should be able to to put that amount in. Of course, now tomorrow I'll find out something right. changes. Just one of those things where it, it feels, could be up one hundred thousand, right. it could be down. Yep. So, so but that yeah, the current path we're on. We have a number of students coming back in the district, which is really exciting. It's found. Um, and then I guess the the one thing we haven't talked about is you were you said that the only public commentary you'd gotten about the Chinese program was negative. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Well, part of it was that I believe I may not have explained well enough sort of long-term vision for it, in part because I said, I don't know if anyone will sign up, which is true. And so I didn't want to commit to um, a long-term model. In, in our discussions, thinking about where it could potentially go is we felt that if there was a strong turnout in seventh grade and eighth grade, we could build that up into a full-time position over the course of the next four years. And the idea would be to split the position between middle school and high school, which would allow us to do seventh and eighth grade and Chinese one and two at the high school, at which point it, students who are interested in continuing studies could take courses at Smith College. So there was a plan, um, but I didn't put that all out there because um, I really don't know, and I don't think we could ever know until we offer the course whether or not students would take it. Did that answer your question, Ms. Fallon? Yes, it does. Okay. Other comments, yes. So um, thank you, Dr. Plummer. I, I want to say that I really not only love this idea, but I really appreciate the process. I'm, I'm somebody that, um, I think I said this at the last meeting, and I was advocating for a, a um, an inclusion specialist or a inclusion co-teaching coach, if you will. That's what I envisioned. And I quickly talked to a bunch of people, and I learned that that idea would not be as well received as the idea that has bubbled up. And I thank everybody for bubbling up this idea. Um, and I was one who, you know, I personally, I, I was in a school psych program at San Diego State, oh. looking forward to testing. <laughs> and interesting. immediately my guard went up. and. It just didn't feel right, and talking to you convinced me otherwise. And, and I think following that conversation we had, I've talked to some other people who really see this as getting to the same idea that I think we all wanted, which was to strengthen this WINS initiative to take both a, a current look and a long-term view. And it's not like we're swimming in money. So I think we used some really creative ideas. We came together. We came up with something that 
it sounds like, and I don't know how we're going to vote, but it sounds like at least stakeholders in the community really like um, and your efforts to um, kind of shape this and talk about it in an honest, truthful way was, a, was the, the big thing that sold me, so thank you. Um, and one more quick question. Do you think, I know it's hard to find school psychologists, mm -hmm. but do you think the nature of how this job will be described will be more attractive maybe yes. even to some existing folks? Absolutely, who, especially to people who've gone through programs in the last decade. I went through yeah, my program yeah. for the last decade, but even my cohort was very motivated by the more systems level work right. that we do right. versus, and, and believe me, they'll still get to test if they do happen to, you know, but it, it will just be so much more than that. Right. So do we in turn need to change our job description for I don't think so. I've looked at it pretty recently, but I'll definitely look at it again. Um, I think um, more and more school districts are going that way, but I don't know that, um, I don't know if anyone, uh, there could be some around here that have yep. full time for an elementary school of this size, but it's pretty unique. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of people who would be uh, very interested. Right. in that type of position. And we have a lot of our current folks have, have strong connections to some graduate programs, and I think that could be great. Ms. Foss. I'm just going to share one other thing that you shared with me that I found very helpful and encouraging so other committee members can hear it, and that is this position also is well established in the schools, and um, people know how it works to some extent. Some of the folks are already hired and doing a super good job. And so it's not like we're suggesting a position that we need to figure out the job description as we go and have the kids help us figure out what they need, but instead we just get more of things that are already working. And while I have the mic, I also want to say part of the inspiration for this for me was um, so many members of the public have, and to all of us, just said that your group, um, Dr. Plummer and Josh and Dave, have done a phenomenal job this year. And um, I know I'm speaking for so many people. And I think that also is when you see that, you want to say, how can that group do even more, right? So thank you for everything. Um, I know I'm speaking for a lot of people. OK. Any other questions or discussion about the amendment that's on the table? Okay, so hearing uh, none, then I will ask uh, uh, for a vote. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the amendment is adopted. <coughs> um, we're now back to the main motion, which is the um, FY 2019 uh, budget as amended. Um, any further discussions about the budget or questions about the budget or? Other amendments to the budget. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> One question. A discrete. Almost made it. Here we go. A, a, this is a short question. <laughs> it's a small question. It's about. It's about an item. Um, central services portion of the budget having to do with the, um, locker room, swim, swim, swimming pool locker rooms, and having um, individualized changing spaces. Do you know the numbers of those or any of the details of that? Is that a capital it's a project? Capital project. Yeah, it might be a capital project, but it was in their, it was in their overview. That they mentioned. Yeah, I know that, um, well, I don't have the capital project with me, but I, my understanding of it was that um, they were going to try to create like two changing stall, at least a minimum of two changing stalls that were private. Right, that's what I was wondering, what the numbers, how expansive that. Um, I think that that was my recollection of it. I, I could pull okay. it up. No, it's not, it's not essential. Yeah. I just, it's, not, it's not part of the budget we're voting on, but I no. think that, is, um, that was my understanding, because a, a number of students change in the shower or change right. in the bathroom yeah. stalls, because it's sort of a traditional, well, yes. traditional to the way probably most of us you know, right. we're in locker rooms where it's just a wide open space. Exactly. So, so I think they were trying to create um, some changing. Anyway, I wanted to speak in support of that and, and um, sort of thank whoever included that in the capital part to, for doing it. And hopefully it'll be a large enough option, in other words, as, as many of those as possible so that it's not, a, um, it's not an odd thing, mm -hmm. so, that it's a, so that it can be a commonly used thing. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ms. Pisansky. I don't think this is really, I'm not sure if this really is directly part of the budget, but I guess in sort of the dis, I, what has come up the past couple months is I've heard from you, Dr. Provost, of that in, that the WINS model, there's sort of a five-year rollout or a five-year 
plan and I've heard from a lot of parents that they'd like to really see that plan and I think it could have been in the descriptive part of the budget or not but I just wonder if we'll see what your thoughts are on that because I you know so I want to thank you for asking that question. This is a question that I've had the opportunity to answer many, many times over the last few weeks. I think that um, a statement I made may have been misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. um, what I said was that the, what I believe I said was that the, or what I meant to say, whatever, <laughs> is that the professional development we received says that it takes five years to get to the highest level of implementation. And so what I've clarified in my discussions with parents is, we're a learning organization and we make changes based on the assessment of how things are going in the program and we're also developing relationships that will and skills to help us implement the program better and the way we did it this year will be uh, um, much different than the way i think we do it five years from now but i'm not playing a five move ahead game of chess where i know where each one of those um, next moves coming up will be um, the next piece of the process, if this budget passes, um, especially with respect to Bridge Street, because that's the school where the most significant changes will be happening, is to uh, explain where the staff will be deployed and how they'll be deployed. There are a couple things that are still wild cards in that and will be right up until probably the beginning of summer. One is kindergarten registration. And another thing that um, is becoming more and more on our table is pre preschool registration. Um, as you know from our last meeting, we uh, need to open a fifth preschool class basically now. Some of the information we're getting based on increasing enrollments is that we may need to open a fifth grade, a fifth preschool classroom very close to the beginning of the year next year because we'll be starting out almost at full capacity. So those two things um, will continue to shape and you know there are a number of variables that will always be um, in motion. So what I meant by the five-year plan is that we will keep examining what we're doing, we'll um, throw out things that don't work, we'll identify solutions for problems that we're seeing and try them to see if we can get better results and at the end of five years, we'll be doing this in a much more sophisticated way in a higher level of efficacy than we're doing it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, Mr. Meyer, sorry. I just have, I just have um, so this is more of a global comment. You've heard me say this before, but I just, um, again, I feel good about the creativity and the thought that's gone into expanding services. And I know that, um, we compete with other districts and we also um, try to meet our expectations of providing the best possible education for the students in the city. Um, at the same time, you know, we're talking about this five, you know, five years to reach this place. And again, when I go back to that budget projection, that five years puts us on the other side of that line. Um, when I began working on the override campaign in 2009, one of the things that surprised me was how the school committee was not at the front of the charge. Um, how there were quite a few school committee members who didn't even take a position. Um, and, and that was, you know, again, that was surprising to me. So uh, that, that override effort was successful in large part because the one in 2005 had failed. So I think it took four years to get that organization ready. So we don't have four years. So I would say to, you know, to people who have come and spent their three minutes in front of the podium, they should be ready for three to six months at least um, in an override campaign, being engaged. Because in 10 years, and I'm not even close to Lisa Minnick, um, in 10 years here, the hoped for help from Washington and Boston, it never comes. And so the only way that we've addressed our needs is to ask the people of Northampton to fund schools that they want. Um, so I'm just, I'm hoping that we're all, you know, this is a great budget. We are, we are trying to do better every year. Um, but at the same time, I think that if we're going to be ready to meet that challenge when it comes, that we need to start organizing now. And I think that as a school committee, we need to take a leadership role. Um, so we need to make it part of our job to build that infrastructure, to build that you know, infrastructure in our wards um, so that when it comes time to activate it, we're ready to do it. Dr. Provost. I just wanted to add an informational piece that I think supports uh, Mr. Meyer's 
position. Something that was shocking to me last week and has never happened to me in my career of implementing federal grants is we got notification from the federal government that they were reducing our grants in the current year. Um, and that can't bode well for the future um, in terms of the federal government coming riding in on a white horse. So I think what you say is exactly right. I was, you know, checking the, the omnibus bill does actually push back. So they were going to zero out Title II, um, and they pushed it back to level funding. Um, but again, there's no, there's no guarantee that that, that can't go away. Um, that's not a huge part of our budget, but it's enough to really hurt, so. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Scott. A couple of uh, just questions, Dr. Barbos, for clarity. So um, we're adding a third, is it a third, third grade teacher at Bridge? Um, it would be a third first grade teacher third at Bridge. First, thank you. Um, but we're reducing the amount of SPED staff. Um, how, would we, how do we reconcile that in terms of the plan moving forward? And, you know, if that, does that amount to less support, extra teacher, less SPED staff? What's, the, what's been the discussion around that? Are we Two things that I think um, will allow or, or sort of feed into that decision is that we have a number of students who are currently in the fifth grade who are receiving um, a kind of specialized kind of support that we will no longer be providing for them at Bridge Street next year because they'll be in the middle school. So that creates more flexibility with the teacher who's in that position. Okay. The, other, um, the other piece is sort of one of the pieces of learning that we had from this year, which is that in the first grade with this particular group of students coming up from kindergarten, having three classes may be more beneficial than having extra special education support. We recall at the beginning of this year, one of the concerns was about having two classes and having um, too many kids in those classes. We think that maintaining three, at least through first grade, at least for this group, I think will help us to avoid a lot of the problems that we saw last year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. a second, a second a question. So within the budget, I, I understand um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but we have a 0.5 uh, high school technology in Integrator. Integrator. Um, so if we're approving the budget and that and that is part of the budget, and if something were to shift in our plan for one-to-one -one Chromebook implementation, how would that affect that person's position? I would argue that that position should be increased even if we don't uh, move forward with su significant increases in Chromebooks. Because, um, well, another item that's on the agenda later will be talking about changes that I think the Department of Education will be making with graduation requirements with respect to computer science. Um, and I think that um, the high school really hasn't had the same kind of level of support that the other schools have. And so I, I believe they're, they're short-staffed in that area. Well, how much are they staffed at now? Do you know offhand? They have a half-time person. Yeah, so they already would have this person going full-time? Yes, <coughs> as it is at the middle school. Did that answer your questions? Okay. okay. Any other questions? Um, Maybe more just, uh, just a comment than anything else, just uh, speaking to Mr. Meyer's point. Um, I'm, I'm excited about this budget this evening in reaching um, a point where we'll be able to hopefully make a vote this evening to approve the budget. Um, and there's been a lot of um, healthy discussion and scrutiny over the budget by members of the school committee, which I think is, is wonderful. I hope you understand it well and that you appreciate everything that it does to support uh, the students of Northam Public Schools. Uh, Mr. Myers' point is well made. Um, the wonderful work we're doing, the addition of programs, the support that uh, we're able to uh, provide for the students here in Northampton is something that I think people in Northampton come to appreciate and, um, and deserve for their children. Uh, over the next few years, as we time out um, uh, further budgets, we'll see that it will become more and more challenging to continue to uh, provide this high level of service to our students. And so I would just once again, echo the words of Mr. Meyer um, as we move forward. Um, the support that we get, the financial um, backing that we can use in order to um, provide this level of service to the generosity of 
of the city and, and the mayor's advocacy. Um, uh, it really comes from the people here of Northampton. <coughs> and when we look to the, the state and the federal agencies to help support us, um, that's not as dependable as um, the good people of Northampton have been for overrides in the past. And eventually we'll get there again. We're working really hard to create programs, sustain programs, and um, in order to sustain them in the future, we'll have to make sure that finances are in, um, in order in order to do that. So um, to Mr. Meyer's point, um, I think it is uh, appropriate for us to think about uh, a stance or communication among people in town that um, the funding that we'll need in order to keep things moving in the direction that they're moving is um, going to have to come through the generosity of those people that live in Northampton. Um, and so I just offer that up because there, there have been times in the recent past where the discussions have been harder around the budgets in regards to how to continue to maintain a high level of service to our students. I think we have a solid budget this year that supports students very well, um, but without the financial backing and the support needed in order to fund them, it could be easily um, removed or eroded over time. So something to keep in mind, I appreciate you bringing it up, Mr. Meyer. Um, thank goodness we're not there this year. This year looks and should prove to be a, a, a better year than last year as I think that's what we strive for every year on this committee and as a district to provide better and better education for students in Northampton so thank you thank you okay so if there are no other comments or questions um, I will ask <coughs> to uh, take a vote on the budget um, and I'm actually just we'll have a roll call vote just because it's the single most important vote we take as a committee, I think, every year. So we'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Rusty Nancy? Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Ms. Ann Hennessy? Yes. Ms. Lori Hoffman? Yes. Mr. John Meyer? Yes. Mr. Henry Hall? Yes. Ms. Susan Bell? Yes. Mr. Edward Tuskey? Yes. Ms. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Cheer now. What's that? <laughs> Quiet. Does everybody understand what just happened? Yeah, well, we can cheer, but yeah, I think uh, I, we, there probably should be one extra person being voting on this budget, the person who put a lot of time into it. Yes. I'm ready to cheer. <laughs> <laughs> last budget. Uh, because it's your last budget. How many budgets, uh, Candace? 37. 37. We have a little token of appreciation for you in honor of your 37. anything further or just <laughs> get the heck out of here <laughs> no but I expect I'll be getting some phone calls next year I've already been told that so. <laughs> it did feel good driving home after the last meeting I got about halfway down 91 and I went it's my last budget book <laughs> thank you all thank you thank, thank you. you okay so next we have a discussion on a uh, memorandum of, of understanding on programming the acceleration of computing and equity uh, which is also known as PACE, lab program. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Department of Education and Department of Higher Education have taken a vote to require um, computer science as a graduation requirement for students at some point in the future um, and in some way in the future. Discussions about exactly how to implement this are um, in the very preliminary stages. One of the ways that um, we are organizing in order to try to inform that decision is um, through this project called um, Programming the Acceleration of Computing Equity. Um, the program initially will have 14 districts um, 
Northampton, and they're identified as lighthouse districts. There are districts who are identified as um, wanting to be a part of, or that the, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents wanted to have is involved in the discussion early on because they have um, a reputation for um, having a little deeper understanding of computer science and the needs of uh, students to understand technology. Uh, Northampton has, is one of that original cohort of 14 districts. It's the only Western Mass district. In fact, um, because there are different conceptions of where Western Mass begins, <laughs> it's the, the only district uh, west of Worcester that's involved. So it's our opportunity to have some influence in the discussions. Uh, this memorandum asks for me to sign, but also asks me to um, to affirm that the school committee understands what I'll be doing and is supportive of it. Um, I would ask um, that you allow me to be the voice of Western Mass in this um, because this is our opportunity to really make some decisions about where does this fit into the curriculum, which I think is one of the biggest questions right now. Um, there's a question about whether it's a science or whether it's a math or whether it's an elective um, that has to be sorted out. There are also questions about what types of certifications should be required for people teaching these courses. Um, so if you agree and allow me to uh, be a part of it, I'll be able to represent um, our interests at the table and also be able to report back to you on um, sort of the inner workings of um, this as this new initiative rolls out. The uh, Memorandum does request some information, so I did contact the director and ask, you know, if I ask my committee for their support, I'm going to have to be able to represent something about what kind of information. And at this point, really what they're trying to do is get a sense of just documenting what the practices are across the state, because as you can imagine, they're all over the page. Um, and so basically the data request that's included with this MOU is really about um, just trying to explain to the Department of Ed what our own practices around computer sciences are. The other piece that I think um, is interesting about this is it's the first piece of curriculum, possibly with the exception of um, vocational education that I can think is starting with an, with an emphasis on equity. And um, a big concern here is that female students and students of color are underrepresented in computer science courses now. It's one of the rationales for a requirement, which would you know sort of level the playing field, um, and in a similar way that uh, s that medicine and law have seen some shifts uh, towards a more diverse, um, more diverse workforce as the courses that sort of lead up to the higher ed programs that would allow you to qualify for medicine and law have become required. Um, the sense is that doing the same thing with computer science may help to. Um, may help to make that workforce more diverse. The other reason that I think this is really important is the same reason why this is uh, part of the IT pathway that we're pursuing at the high school. Right now in our area, we have almost three positions for every qualified applicant in IT. And in order to be um, viable as, as an economy, I think um, we need to be able to provide a workforce that um, will uh, be attractive to employers. So for all those reasons, I would just um, sort of ask for a sense of the committee. It's not a vote, but just a sense of the committee if you think you would feel comfortable with me signing the MOU and participating in this group. Yes, Ms. Hennessy. I love that it's starting with in a place of <coughs> equity. I would hope that in your discussions that this will, I'm sure, be an unfunded mandate that you talk about that as an equity mm -hmm. issue also because it's mm -hmm. going to be a funding issue amongst many cities in this um, in the state but I I support it so is this a vote of the Board of Education or what was the who had a Board of Ed and Board of Higher Ed basically okay. said that we need to start thinking about what are the requirements for computer science you know we have a sense of what we want students to come out of high school with in science math languages but right now um, computer science is treated vastly differently um, all across the Commonwealth. Okay. Doctor. I'm teaching a course. Um, I just meant to learn a doctor. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Boss. Um, I'm teaching a course um, that is actually NSF funded and designed that's uh, exploring computer science and it's specifically designed to try to engage 
um, and promote achievement in underrepresented minorities in computer science. And I'd say one of the things for people who are concerned about um, this becoming a coding requirement, mm -hmm. it's, it's explicitly not that. Um, that uh, I was working with some other teachers, most of them from Eastern Mass, and it's interesting that um, there is no computer science certification yet, and so we all are sort of drawn from, pulled from our various mm -hmm. subject matter areas. Um, but we are all talking excitingly about after we participate in drafting the standards, now we actually could get to be real boys um, or <laughs> women. Um, and so uh, so the, the thing is that the, um, the standards and the goal, um, well, I think it's important to be part of this discussion because it will define it. And I think it is um, you know, for the economic reasons, but also for all of the fields that it touches, you know, teaching science is hard to do without talking about data analysis using um, computers. And so they're valuable tools, even if you're not going to become a computer science um, major and, and pursue it you know, in, in the industry. I think one of the other things is that the industry realizes that they have a, a shortage of people to fill these jobs in Massachusetts. So I would hope that, um, that there's been, there already has been cooperative funding, but that in, in talking about how are you going to afford this, mm -hmm. that they would continue to participate and continue to make sure that, um, that the funding is there so that schools can actually provide the courses that we're committing to that to provide. Um, I'll echo a lot of what I've already heard. Um, there's definitely a need for more women and minorities in the field of computer science. and. I find my students often don't have any experience in computer science when they arrive at Smith College for engineering, and it, it really slows them down. And our students will be far better off mm -hmm. thinking about what they want to do when they go to college. Um, it's absolutely true that this country has unfilled jobs in these areas, um, and I think we can participate in this and be a leader. It's terrific. One comment I have, I don't know how it fits in. Um, I agree that a lot of these companies probably do want to participate in um, educating their employees of the future and as we've seen on the news this past week with Facebook and other companies they're not always out there just to do the right thing um, so I, I offer an observation and mm -hmm. and I don't there's three people on there are three entities on this memorandum of understanding including something called Education Development Center Incorporated Mass Can and I tried to figure out who they are, um, but they're sponsored by a lot of places that, like <coughs> Google, Microsoft, um, a couple others that are into software and data storage, and are really out there to make money. So I, I just think we all, I'm glad you're participating, and you can say we're about education and not just about some of the things these companies want to do to make money, and just keep an eye on that, because we're entering into an agreement with them. This was probably a, a longer discussion than you imagined. But um, um, so I'm just looking at the time frame here, and we're really talking like a seven-week period, um, or maybe longer. Okay, maybe it's April and May. Um, and it's a lot of time. You sure you want? To, I mean, I, I'm really happy that you were asked, and I'm proud that Northampton was 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 identified. But this is a lot of time. It I mean, is it is it away from the office for three days times three people times the other stuff? Is that something that you're Am I misreading this, or is it? No, you're not misreading it. It is a commitment of time. Yeah. Um, it is sort of my philosophy on all of these things that have come from the Department of Education is that when you have an opportunity to influence what will ultimately be your mandate, mm -hmm. you, you should take that up. Well, so, I think it's a noble cause, and I'm, I'm proud that they asked you, and I think you'd be a great rep. I just think, I mean, that, that trade off of time for no money, why didn't they? Are they at least going to pay for your travel to, well, to them all? I doubt it. <laughs> I'm sure EDC is getting a couple hundred thousand bucks to do it. it, it mm -hmm. It's surprising that they're not offering something. Mm -hmm. It's not surprising that they're waiting till the end of the year to do this, and it'd be better to do in the summer. But it's your call. But I, I got it. I mean, end of the year, John. If nine days out of the office, it's gonna be tough for you. But it's your family. <laughs> yes, Miss Fallon. Um, so I appreciate your willingness to represent all of Western Mass um, in this, and I'm glad that you'll be a part of it, but I do hope that you'll report back to us on kind of where it goes, because I feel like that's not something that we want to be surprised about at some point, like, oh, and then there's this new requirement. So I'd love it if you updated us on the process, because um, I feel like there's a lot 
that you've had, you've introduced and a lot of initiatives that you're following, and I'm not even sure sometimes once you initially broach them where they end up. Mm -hmm. So I would love to just a five minute update at some point. Thanks. Okay, so um, no formal vote requested yeah. here, but I get the sense from the committee that yep. they're comfortable with moving forward on this. Um, Next, we have a second reading. This is on the request to name the Jackson Street Greenhouse in honor of um, Mary Bates. And this is, again, a second reading. Um, I'm a placeholder. I don't know if, Gwen, you want to speak again on this? Or, I mean, I've, this is about um, Mary Bates is a first grade teacher. This is a secret. <laughs> um, it's a whisper. <laughs> Who is I don't know if that's a secret, if she's retiring. Okay, because <laughs> now it isn't. She does. Um, but she's done amazing work on the gardening projects at all the elementary schools, all the elementary schools, particularly at Jackson Street. And they have this amazing greenhouse that was a much bigger project. I think Gwen alluded to this at our last meeting. Um, and to honor and recognize the work that Mary's done on this project. Um, would like to name it on her behalf and I know I've received some letters I'm sure we all have from past teachers who's you know one who's in San Francisco now and just lauding the work that Mary's done so second reading of six okay any other questions about this one can I just say one thing sure. I'm not gonna say this again there are a number of people on this school committee whose kids had Mary Bates as their teacher and the passion and um, commitment that she put into all of her work and um, into the garden and how she saw early childhood as a place of exploration and that kids should be getting their hands dirty, um, I think really, really, really needs to be uh, really held, uh, you know, held on to as we are continually under pressure for, to do other things and that outside piece um, is just so great. So. That's my piece. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so that will uh, that that uh, consists of our second reading. Um, now we have a report and a discussion on policy FF, which is the naming of public school facilities. Um, this will be Laura Fallon. Settle in, my friends. Settle. In. <laughs> so, <laughs> subcommittee um, rules and policies subcommittee looked at this um, because. We've been in the process of doing so many six-time readings for various um, naming proposals. And so we went back and examined our policy, which was approved in 1999 and then adopted in 2003. Um, we were struck by the stated goal, even from that long ago, of choosing people who merit recognition and who reflect the diversity of Northampton school population. And we realized that perhaps we should be doing a better job of that. Um, and the MASC had updated this policy in 2016 when they had updated all of those policies that created our backlog. Um, and so we looked at their sample policy, um, and that struck us in that they said if the name is being initiated at the local school level, that the principal should take reasonable steps to include both the school council and the PTO um, in the nomination um, before submitting it to the school committee. And we liked that aspect of it. Um, but their sample policy gives no specific time frame other than the chair will specify a consideration period that allows for public comment, following which the school committee will deliberate and vote. Um, what was also of interest to us when we looked at the sample policy was that the MASC had separated out policy FF and then policy FFA, which was called memorials. Um, and we weren't sure how the committee felt about that. Um, it's very short and I'll tell you, it says, the school committee recognizes that the death of a student, member of the staff, or prominent community member is deeply felt by the school community. As places designed primarily to support learning, school sites should not serve as the main venue for permanent memorials. Permanent memorials within the school should be limited in form to perpetual awards or scholarships. Any permanent memorials in existence before the adoption of this policy can only be removed by a vote of the school committee. And so that's not an aspect that was ever included in our policy, and we weren't sure whether that was a policy that this committee felt we should consider adopting. Um, so we were hoping to get feedback about that. Um, we also examined policies from 
probably too many districts, which is what complicated it all for us. Um, but the ones that we examined most closely, be, they each had very different perspectives that were of interest to us. So for example, um, Ludlow absolutely specified no time limit or a minimum number of readings. Um, Framingham, which interestingly states that the names of persons currently employed by the city shall not be considered, which we hadn't thought about it, and then we, we did think about it. We thought, well, that actually kind of makes sense, um, and we weren't sure how anyone felt about that. Um, there's also states that the naming of rooms and areas at the local school level should be carried out by special committee formed by school council, PTO, and inclusive of staff, students, parents, and community, <laughs> that the process should be open and allow a reasonable time frame for considering options and requires one public hearing. And finally, East Longmeadow policy was different in that they stated it was their practice to never name buildings or facilities after an individual, but will utilize other means of recognition such as plaques or signs. Uh, and the way their process works is that an ad hoc subcommittee considers the request and brings a recommendation, recommendation back to the full committee. Um, members of the community are invited to appear before them and weigh in, and then um, they vote on it. So. I guess what struck us was that there we're the only ones with a very clearly delineated time period of six months in our policy. Um, <clears throat> and so we were hoping to get feedback on whether it was the six months that really resonated with us as being important or whether it was a thoughtful consideration. Because really, we're spending six readings, but there's very little conversation about it. Once it comes to the level where it's on TV, who's going to say, like, actually, that person was terrible. We're not going to name something after them. And so it really puts it in a little bit of an awkward position for someone to even say this seems like this is a, a popularity contest or a passing fancy or something like that. And so we loved the idea of, um, of maybe having a more thoughtful process um, that wasn't bound so much by time constraints. Um, so what we were hoping was that you would weigh in, sure wish I could find that last page of notes, that you would weigh in and let us know your thoughts on um, whether or not, so in recognition of the constraining factors, I mean, there's only so much space we have to name and the permanence <coughs> of these spaces. Um, how do you feel about a separate um, policy for memorials and have that the only scholarships? Like we don't want to have little plaques, you know, like memorials all over the school grounds or not. Um, how you felt about creating that policy, FFA. Um, your thoughts on the time constraint of six months uh, versus the thoroughness of the process, for example, including the um, school council and PTOs. Um, the idea of perhaps instead of doing this, having one public hearing um, where anyone in the community would come and um, discuss uh, plus two readings, for example, whether you'd prefer like an ad hoc subcommittee, um, and whether moving forward we should disallow current employees from consideration. So we just, we, there were so many options. We were all three of us coming at it from totally different angles, and we saw the merits of many different ways of going about this, and we hope to get a little more input from the rest of the committee before we took it back to subcommittee and actually crafted a policy. Dr. Provost. Can I just quickly add one thing that was part of the discussion, but I don't think came through in what you said, <laughs> uh, which is that none of the um, discussion that, that we're talking about with respect to this policy in any way is a reflection of any of the individuals right, who are currently right. under consideration for having something named. Yeah. No, it was more that this, this process of six readings seems yeah. a little yeah. tedious. It was that this year alone we had three I mean, in like the last nine months, I think we've had. Yeah, and, and actually, there was a real concern that we wouldn't finish our process in time for Ms. Right. Bates's yeah. retirement. Right, Ms. Bates. Yes, Miss Bates taught four of my children, so trust me, I'm a huge Miss Bates supporter. Like I'd name yeah. streets after her, but it, your house, in fact. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so this is why we're re-examining it moving forward. We realize their policy, perhaps the six readings might be a little excessive. Okay. So do people have feedback? Uh, yes. I, I guess, Mr. Meyer. as a person who is <laughs> denigrating <laughs> process, I, I, I'll say in this case, um, this isn't, this is, we have a limited number of facilities to name. 
Um, the policy doesn't even contemplate the procedure for even substituting a name. I remember we had to be creative with the Tudrin naming, calling, okay, we'll call this the facility and the fields already named. So, I mean, it doesn't say we need to have six readings is the other thing. It just says it has to be under consideration. I mean, we've done six readings. Um, I think it's very difficult for, it just says under consideration. It doesn't say readings. I and mean, once you have the initial- <coughs> Right, but it's six months. Yeah, but it doesn't say we have to have it on the agenda every time. It just says once we put it out there, we can say we are inviting public comment. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I just think when you're doing something that's going to bind future school committees, it's a little bit different than when you're making a policy or making a decision that can be undone right, by the next school committee without a lot of problem. Um, so. I mean, you, but then if, if you limit it, well then what's the reasonable, what's the next stopping point below six months? Is, is three months too short? I mean, I, I think some of your proposals about involving school count, like affirmatively setting out involving school councils and involving PTOs, um, that, that I think would be a positive change because I think that that could potentially expand the pool of people that would be placed forward. Um, for, for consideration. Um, I think it's a hard process because it, we don't have that many, I mean, it's, it's sort of a special thing. We don't have that many facilities that have been named for individuals. And so I think that that's why is you make it exceptionally difficult. And, and again, I don't know whether that's the right policy judgment, but at least that's what the current policy seems to lean toward. Thoughts? <laughs> I guess I have a thought, which is only this is a separate thing that's happening in the, um, th is not happening in Northampton. I just want to firmly say that. But one of the things that you're bringing up um, that is happening outside of this community is that people are, um, have been, had awards named after them only later to find out that it, they're kind of complicated people and perhaps we don't want an award named after that person for some of the views that they held. So I guess the other question is how do we handle if at some point somebody came forward and said there really is documentation that somebody was not an upstanding citizen as we see it now, um, what we do in that case. And I don't know if that's something else that we need to consider in a policy or not. There's just the exceptions to this may be made by the school committee. Mm -hmm. Right, and <laughs> right, and I <laughs> and I don't know if there needs to be a policy of <laughs> reflection or taking, you know. But I mean, a school committee could rename something mm -hmm. just well, as easily would, as they name. That would be it. under the, because it says yeah. schools or school areas named for the person who retain that person name for as long as the facility or area is used by the district for instructional or school related purposes. I mean, it doesn't say you can rename. All it says is that exceptions. I'm a little, I'd be, I'm dubious of binding future bodies to anything. Oh no, that's, that's why it does have the exceptions language. Well, it just doesn't say how you do it. That's Got an it. important point because one of the policies we looked at, Ludlow actually says, it's the policy of the school committee, the names of existing structures or spaces under our jurisdiction will not be changed. Historical preservation and respect for traditions are a key component in honoring our past. So you can go the total opposite end. So I think an out clause like that, like the one we already have, mm -hmm. is, is prep enough. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> super what is the process? I mean, do we need a process to know how to get out? I guess that was really my question. Like, what would that look like? But I don't know. That doesn't help your question. No. I support having the PTO and the school councils involved. Yes, uh, Dr. Provost, then. I just wanted to share something that was part of my contribution to that discussion, which is um, going to the same point, but for a completely different reason. Um, I look at parking lots and school buildings right now that are completely surrounded by named objects, right. and knowing what to do in the future, if we there was ever a thought to expand anything, um, makes me think that it would be helpful to have some sort of a clear-cut process for unnaming or removing something. Yes, Ms. Fallon. Um, just an observation and coupling up with what Ms. Fallon said of once this proposal reaches this body here, it does seem very um, unlikely that somebody's going to stand up and say, no, that person, let's not name it after them. So I think that period of six months 
feels like you know we might miss giving this award in the current case before somebody retires because it's sitting here for six months when probably nothing is going to happen so I would be supportive of shortening that substantially and maybe having some other I, I'm not all that familiar with the current procedure but some other process that you're discussing before it reaches the school committee but having a much shorter point and I do like the idea of maybe two readings or however we would want to phrase it so that if somebody heard something proposed and wanted to comment on it they would have a chance to come comment but I think the six months is excessive at this level I was part of the discussion but I do, do want to add that I think the six months is is a good amount of time for a few reasons one but it depends on what we change because if we do want to capture diversity in terms of naming things then I think it needs to be more than a small group of people in one school like and this is where I think mm -hmm. it gets muddied for me because someone needs to be overlooking the system the district so if just one school is saying we want this named and the school council and the PTO are looking at it then this small group of people are looking at it and then it comes to us whereas I think for many reasons uh, uh, someone has to be looking at the full picture um, and the reason I, I think two months is too brief is I just think we don't know enough about some things and I'd just rather be safe than um, safe and sorry to use a terrible phrase but um, in that respect and the other thing um, I, I'd like to you to I'd love to know what people think about the memorials memoriams because that to me is a really interesting policy um, to so I'd like to I'd like to go back to that also Do people have thoughts on the, on the no memorial policy yes mr. Meyer um, I, I think that the memorial policy even more than the named facilities it runs into the difficulty of it's how do you relocate that appropriately how do you oh I'm sorry but, anyways, but you're oh, saying no but saying. you're saying no more right the thing about the scholarship is the yeah. scholarship it's, is is a perpetual remembrance of the person yeah. and it's and it's doing good yeah. you know for students perpetually whereas the physical you know locating the yeah. physical more memorial well it is you know sometimes seems the most appropriate it does in the reality of you may decide to relocate facilities um, and then you have to decide what's the best way to do that if you even want to do that and I think that has the potential I mean, the thing I, you don't want to have you don't want to have something you're trying to do to help the community be tied to the schools then become a point as and again we're not we're not here but as it has in the south with historical memorials become a point of division for the community Absolutely. and and so I guess that that's why again that this bar seems so high I think it in some senses it should be and that that is addressed in this policy <clears throat> that any more any permanent memorials in existence before the right. adoption can only be removed by a vote of the school committee so this would just be for saying moving forward no right. permanent memorials right. that would be scholarships yes, I just want to add, I, I do feel like the six month period seems excessive to me, excessively long. I don't, and I kind of wonder how we came, I don't know if we have folks who've been around long enough to know how we even came up with that. <laughs> we don't name that many things. I mean, I think right. one of the experiences is that I think there have been four things named in 10 years and two of them in the last six months. So it's, you know your experience of oh we're you know we have all these things that we want to name and we're hamstrung because we can't get them named fast it, it just we don't name many facilities we don't name but that's not really what I'm responding to I don't feel like we're hamstrung in, or in, in any way well I then I don't understand like the it what? just feels like an excessive period there's nothing else it seems like an excessively long period of time for something that nothing is probably going to happen during that excessively long well, period of time like in the fifth month something's going to come out that uh I mean the other thing is if you're saying these people has it are sick, ever happened are these well again that's if you're taking the six months as the time when the whistleblower is going to come in on the other hand you could say these people provided such amazing service support to the community that I mean we can't just say well you know the name's on the agenda let's do it again we can also say let's take this seriously mm -hmm. and for people who haven't heard Right? We want to recognize that you know if, if you give 30, 40 years of, of service, is it too much to say that you get a total of 12 minutes at six school committee meetings? I mean, I don't, 
I just don't, I don't, I think it depends on how you treat the six months. If you treat the six months as a nuisance, or you could treat the six months as we're going to recognize this person. It's going to be on the agenda six times. So that means that people will have for six months the opportunity to say, hey, this is happening in my community. Because again, people don't pay attention to us. They really don't. And so it's like, that's again, and that's part of the argument for more process, right? Is that people, you're like, people are busy, so they miss this. So I mean, look, I'm very happy to hear you advocating for more process. <laughs> don't get me wrong. So <laughs> that being said, I don't feel very strongly about six months versus four or three. So very happy to defer to others who would like more process. I think the added twist here is that we've tried to keep this secret. So we, we kind of chuckle because we're bringing it up. And I'm not sure where, why we've brought it up. I mean, I agree. If there's a better process, we should and we should think about another process. But it's it's uh, it struck me as rather silly in these last three, where we're just kind of bringing it up and laughing and trying to keep it secret. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, I would I would think that, that there's was, a there's a better. That was just Sal. Sal wanted. To be there was a, not anymore. <laughs> I think everybody, I think I three out of three is sick from what I recall. But that's besides the point. I, and I do agree that if we want to do something, we should do something. Six months, yeah, to me, it, it seems like three months would be just as fine. But I, I mean, I, I, this is a really difficult conversation. I wonder, was it Long Meadow that went, which is Long Meadow that went to, um, they don't do this? Uh, East Long Meadow. East Long Meadow. Yeah, East Long I mean, that makes it's their practice to not name buildings or facilities after an individual, yeah, but they will utilize other means of recognition such as plaques or signs. I see. Okay. So I th think you've got more wall space for plaques. Right. I just wonder if they reach that conclusion based on something, but uh, I, I don't really. I mean, I just like. I feel yeah, there was more to their policy, and actually, they talked about how it could divide a community, yeah. how divisive the whole process could be, and so they were on the opposite end. I think that they wanted to have the process be quick so that it didn't have time to fester and get really contentious. Like they thought it was important that the committee act quickly on recommendations for naming. So, Mr. Moore, and then I'll go back to Mr. Ryan. It seems to me there's also there's some of these po policies envision two different processes. One is where you have a thing like a building that you're in search of a name for, so you're winnowing a whole bunch of names and picking the one. And then we also have, and I'm sure every other district does too, where you have a person who you'd like to name something for and you're picking what you're going to name mm -hmm. <laughs> after them. And, um, and those are two very different processes actually in terms of what, what should go into it. So for example, if you had, if we built a building and it had no name and we had to decide, are we just gonna call it you know, the high school or are we going to name it then we'd have a very different process where, you know, like these ones that set up a committee that, you know, receives a bunch of suggestions and thinks about it and discusses it. And, and again, in terms of, you know, naming, picking a name that, you know, increases sort of the representation of marginalized communities and so on, you know, would take into account all those things. That's really very different than if you have name, naming, you have a person <laughs> who you can't make represent anybody other than themselves, and you're going to pick an appropriate thing to name after them as a way to recognize that person, and which might be a different process, I think. Um, so I don't know, that's another school Paul, you want two policies, one for where you're starting with the person and one where you're starting with the, yeah. with the mm -hmm. building that's or mm -hmm. the room or the stadium or whatever. Uh, Mr. I'm just curious about the sign and plaque <coughs> thing. So you just put up a sign or a plaque, but it's not, it's just like this sign <laughs> is here. It doesn't point to anything. It just, I'm. We could do a site visit. <laughs> <laughs> I just say, I'm just. Cinder that. block I'm is you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. um, Can I just answer? So what Howard yeah. was saying, that our current policy actually does address that issue. Oh, it does? Yeah. It didn't seem like it. It, it does, because it has two different processes. It has one for um, naming or renaming a building, and that's the one where you have to form an advisory committee and all that. And then the other is naming or renaming all other school areas. And that's just, that's not a subcommittee, that's not an ad hoc mm. committee, it's just submitted in writing, including reasons why the name is appropriate. 
And yeah. so I think that we do sort of address yeah. exactly what you're saying. But in terms of the overarching goals, that was what I was really talking about, was where you're going to try to, with our name, do this. You can't really do that if you start with a person. You, you know, it's like you can't say we, we aren't going to name anything after you because you're um, not part of the diversity picture. Oh, okay. I see you know what, what I mean? Saying. Right. Sort of that, that it would be that you're more likely to choose. A, yes. Yeah. Got it. Ms. Burnham. Yeah. Um, I um, appreciated what Ms. Hennessy was saying about sort of the overarching um, picture, and I realized like it would be interesting. Um, Ugh, I hate suggesting this because as, as if somebody needs to do this job, which I don't want to do that, but um, to perhaps um, I could offer my services to go through and, f and make a list of everything that we have named, because part of this is that actually we name things and we don't know who has been named, and um, that it could be, um, I mean, it is difficult, I agree, Howard, um, as the person who brought forward Ms. Agna to have a playground <laughs> named after her. It was just so perfect. Like, it was, I mean, it was just so perfect. And the, the playground and the person, were, you know, there was just like, well, that's a no-brainer. Um, and, and so it's interesting to consider that. But, of course, there could have been, um, you know, maybe there should have been consideration. You know, there, there are a lot of other factors that I feel, you know, <laughs> that we get caught up in, and we're not thinking of the bigger picture. Um, but I don't even have a list of all of the things in our schools. I mean, we do have a school named after a yeah, beloved <laughs> person, <laughs> or two, JFK too, but he's not local. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how to move forward to get a centralized list of what we have so that as we move forward, there is more discussion, as Mr. Meyer is talking about, to honor these people, to really think about the contribution, and perhaps to, you know, to, to really recognize why they are being put forward. And I agree that there is a gravitas in this that, um, that maybe hasn't been um, so honored. Mm -hmm. Okay. So are you getting? No, I've got nothing. Okay. I have no idea what we're so, going to do. But I mean, we'll I, sit I, down in subcommittee, yeah. figure out more hours. No, but I, I do, I do, I do, I, but I do hear from people. <laughs> I mean, I do hear from people just to try to synthesize it is that there's a sense that so there's a sense that six months might be a long enough period of time, but we're not really doing anything in the six months. Mm -hmm. that, so it's sort of like, well, why are we waiting six months? And so, you know, maybe a hearing, a more formalized hearing, maybe getting a recommendation from the school council in the building that it's happening. I mean, just so that there's some additional evidence that's being considered. During the six, or some other process during the six months. A binder. Tell us, I forgot, <laughs> the one thing I was supposed to check on and I just realized, is there, so for to hold a public hearing, because that's not something we typically do, there. that's the public noticed in the newspaper. So obviously these would not be surprises either. Um, is, there a, is there a fee for that? Um, well, if you're going to do like a legal notice, there's a fee for that. Um, and again, who reads the legal notices is the other problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so a public hearing wouldn't be an official. Like the charter requires the city council to hold, a, you know, public hearings for the budget, public hearings for the capital plan, and it requires a legal notice in the paper. And those are, you know, two hundred bucks. Okay, so we don't want to do in. that. And it's those little small print things that are okay. like crowded together. So, um, but there's certainly other ways you can notify. A public you know. meeting. Yeah, you could do a public meeting and you could do outreach, you know, to school communities about it or something. So, um, so you could certainly create a hearing requirement with some kind of notice mechanism um, so that, you know, just not relying on people looking at our agenda and, you know, hopefully catching it in the six months that it's on there. Apparently, only the people we're honoring actually <laughs> our yeah, like, yes, I just have a question for the Miss Bates Greenhouse, and mm -hmm. that is, this came to us in March. Is there a way to have this happen? In, I assume June is when they want this to happen. So that's not six this, months. The subcommittee is meeting the day before our next school committee meeting, um, April 11th, 11th or 12th. 11th the school committee can always suspend its rules, yeah. Yeah. which, you know, again, that, that's you, you really can't bind a future school committee to anything because 
six votes now and it's unbound. Yeah. So, um, so you could certainly waive rules when the time came um, if you wanted to. So, since Ms. Agnes here, could we ask her what the date would be that would we would like this to be formalized by? Could you hear that, Glenn? Yeah, I did. Um, On the last day of school. Okay. Thanks. So, well, we have end of the year, December, mid June. So it sounds like by the May school committee I think meeting, probably. That would be nice. Maybe yeah. the June. Like let's really drag it out to like the oh. day before. <laughs> <laughs> we could get five in. <laughs> um, we could have some special meetings if you want. Mr. <laughs> 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 <Ms. Sands. laughs> I do feel that having, as much as I am for having a public meetings or public hearings, and I wish the school committee did have, we did conduct more of those or any of those on many subjects, it does feel excessive to me to do it on the naming and that there probably is another process like working with the PTO and the school council to understand better, you know, that they're endorsing this, et cetera. Yeah. So. Job for a liaison. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all for your input. We're going to permanently name you. <laughs> and that's one the measure that's <laughs> Okay, so report discussion. So you have enough to go back to. Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. Um, so there's no new business for tonight. Um, future business and meeting dates uh, we have the superintendent evaluation team meeting on April 4th. Uh, 2018 at 5 p.m. in the superintendent's office. The budget and property subcommittee, April 5th uh, at 5 p.m. in the superintendent's office. Rules and policy committee, April 11th, 3.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. Uh, the school committee meeting uh, with the student advisory committee, that's April 12th at 6.45 p.m. here in the community room, followed by the regularly scheduled school committee meeting at 7.15 p.m. on April 12th in the JFK community room. And I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The school committee meeting is adjourned.